if you can, great. Um, so let's get started, Lars. Good morning, everybody. Um, and good afternoon to Lars and those of you joining us from Europe. Thank you very much for joining our weekly Monty Hardcast conference. Um, and we're really lucky to have Lars Sondergaard from Copenhagen. Um, I always learn so much from Lars. He's truly an expert in structural heart. And he's really been one of the people who've been, who've been forcing us to think not just about treating a patient with valvular disease at the moment, but really thinking of lifelong management and how we can optimize the procedure so that it will allow us to manage these patients longer term. So we're really looking forward to your talk this morning, Lars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Asim, and thank you for the invitation. So again, um, the title will be Issues Related to TAVA in Patients with Longer Life Expectancy. And I will try to make it, um, try to raise what is the problem, or what are the problems, and also how can you overcome these problems in daily clinical practice. So I think you have all seen these two low-risk trials presented about two years ago, the Partner 3, uh, using the Sapien 3 platform from Edvars, Balloon Expandable Valve, included about 1,000 patients, had a primary endpoint of all-cause mortality, stroke and rehospitalization at one year, and showed that TAVA was superior to surgery. The Evolut Low Risk trial was presented at the same time. The design was a little bit different. It included 1,400 patients or more patients, but have a more strict primary endpoint, only including all cause mortality and stroke, so no rehospitalization, but showing that TAVA was non inferior to surgery. And remembering that we have now seen randomized trials on TAVI against best medical treatment in patients at extreme surgical risk. We have seen randomized trials between TAVA and surgical aortic valve replacement at patients at high risk, intermediate risk, and now at low risk. You can say that it's now been proven that TAVA is actually at least as good as surgical aortic valve replacement, no matter what risk profile the patient actually got. And we also have even longer term data. This is from the Notion trial, a very early conducted trial enrolling patient between 2009 and 2013. All patient was at lower surgical risk, having an STS score of around 3% at mean. And you can see now out to eight years, despite this was at the very early phase of TAVA with a lot of learning uh, issues, all cause mortality is the same for TAVA and surgical aortic valve replacement here using the first generation core valve prosthesis. And we also seen a meta-analysis of these seven trials comparing TAVA and surgical aortic valve replacement and if you do a meta-analysis here on all-cause mortality after two years, it's 8,000 patients going into this trial. You can see that patient assigned for TAVA got a 12% reduction in all-cause mortality. And you only, if you only look at the patient who had, was assigned to a transfemal approach, it's actually a 17% reduction in all-cause mortality of two, in, at two years. And the same for stroke, again, the same meta-analysis, 8,000 patients, stroke rate at two years, patient going for TAVA got a 19% reduction in stroke comparing to the surgical cohort. At the same time, we have seen that these procedures has uh, improved impressively during uh, these uh, last, not even 15 years. And these are data from Copenhagen, but I think it could be from anywhere. And you see that the mortality rate is going down. So even if you treat very old and very sick patients, the 30 days mortality rate is often around 1%. And also the hospital stay is much shorter than it used to be. Most patients will be discharged the day after the procedure. And some institutions are even sending selected patients home at the day of the procedure. So not only is it a more safe procedure than surgical aortic valve replacement, but also it's a very streamlined procedure with a little um, burden for the hospital with regard to hospital stay. And if you ask the industry what they see for the future, this is from Abbott looking at how the market for structural heart intervention will be uh, from now on up to 2025. And if you just focus here on TAVA, you can see that currently it's about the market is around 4 billion US dollars. 
And less than five years from now, that's going to be 6.5. So more than 50% increase in market. On the other hand, if you look at the surgical volume here, it's going to diminish from currently 1.5 billion US dollars to down to 1 billion. So there's no doubt that the industry expect this market to increase significantly during the next uh, five years. But as you do that, you have to understand what these study we are basing our guidelines and clinical practice actually showed us. So first of all, you have to understand that the patient who went in to these trials was highly selected. So for the two low risk trials, you can ask yourself, what did low risk actually mean? And you will say, according to the study protocol, it meant that the patient had a low surgical risk. But you could also argue that this patient had a low risk for a suboptimal outcome after TAVA. So these patients need to be suitable not only for a transfemoral access, but for a safe transfemoral access. So very good access vessels. The coronary arteries need to have a high takeoff, not to risk a coronary occlusion. The patient needs to have a tricuspid aortic valve, no bicuspid aortic valve. That could be no severe aortic annulus calcification with the risk of annulus rupture or parvalvular leak, and the same, no calcification of the left ventricular alpha tract. So about one out of three patients actually screened for these studies was rejected due to these anatomical findings. So therefore, you can say that these trials do not necessarily represent all commas, low-risk patients, and some of these patients may be better served with a surgical aortic valve replacement. Second, you have to understand, despite we say that TAV is now indicated across all risk scores, you have to understand that the patient who went into the trials were elderly patients, so not younger patients. So again, these are all trials uh, comparing TAV against a surgical aortic valve replacement. The two first one on the left-hand side is actually best against best medical treatment. And you see it expand from extreme high STS score around 12% down to a very low STS score for the latest trial, about 1%. So again, we have covered all risk scores. But if you look at the mean age of the patient, you can see for the first studies, the mean age was 80 years. It came down for the two ladies, low risk trying to 74 years of age, but not very young patients. So again, patients we're treating are elderly patients, despite we're talking about a patient at low surgical risk. And remember, if you are male of 85 years of age, you've got severe symptomatic autoxygenosis stenosis with no comorbidity, your STS score is going to be around 1.5%. But I think if you're 85 years of age, no matter what your STS score is, this patient will be due to the age assigned to TAVA. So it doesn't really make sense to try to compare this patient with a patient who is 65 or even 60 years of age. That's a different story. But these, these guidelines, uh, which was published in the US uh, last year, also actually included uh, the findings from the, the two low risk trials. So again, you can divide all patients into three groups. Young patients, aged less than 65 years, and life expectancy more than 20 years, these patients go, should go for surgical or valve replacement. On the other end, patients more than 80 years of age with a limited life expectancy less than 10 years should go for transcatheter or valve replacement. And then you have the big difficult group in between 65 to 80 years of age. And here you have, as a heart team, to make the decision, is this patient better served with a surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement? And into that consideration, you should take the life expectancy of the patient and the durability of this fibrostatic aortic valve. There's nothing about risk here. It's all about age and life expectancy combined with durability of the valves. So what we should talk about is patient with longer life expectancy. Forget everything about low risk patients. As I said before, you can be 85 years of age and still be at low surgical risk. It doesn't really make sense because the patient is very old. We should look into what is the patient's predicted life expectancy. And particularly for patients where we believe that this patient is going to live for a long time, it's going to be a completely different story 
that what we have seen in these trials with short term safety outcomes. So what are the issues about treating patients with longer life expectancy? I've lined up four here, you could probably add more. One is, what is the impact of new conduction abnormality? What about access to the coronary arteries in the future? What about patient with bicuspid aortic valve? And again, as you saw in the guideline, what about the durability of these transcatheter heart valves? So if we start with the conduction abnormality, we used to say that a new left bundle block or even a permanent pacemaker was a benign complication for a patient undergoing TAVA. But I think we have now quite a lot of evidence that that's not true. So in this meta-analysis, including more than 40,000 patients, you can see that patient, even with the new onset left bundle band block at one year, got an increased risk of all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and subsequently a permanent pacemaker. So certainly this is something we need to take into consideration, new, new uh, conduction abnormality after time, when we consider to treat a patient with longer life expectancy. And you all know what the issue is about these uh, conduction abnormalities. There's a close proximity between the aortic annulus and the AV node. It's actually the AV node is located just below the membranous septum, which is situated between the right and the non coronary cusp, meaning that a deeper implantation of a transcatheter heart valve is going to increase the risk of new conduction abnormality, left bundle branch block, or even a complete heart block. And we can actually on CT scan nowadays, if you have a good quality CT scan with both contrast in the right and the left side of the heart, measure the length of the membrane septum. And as you see here on the left-hand side, it's not a square, it's a little bit, uh, how should I say, it's tapered up here. So the shortest distance of the membrane septum is always under the right coronary cusp. And also if you do a CT scan in a patient who is undergoing a TAVI, you're going to realize that it's going to sit deepest in the left ventricular alpha tract under the right coronary cusp. So this is the place where to measure. So again, if you have the CT scan, you can have a more patient-specific understanding of what is the risk for this patient to develop uh, conduction abnormality, and also how high do you need to implant in order to avoid that. You know, there's been a shift in how we implant these valves. Um, in the beginning of the TAVI program, most of the physicians was placing the C arm in the cat lab in an LAO cranial projection, what we call a three cusp co planar view. But now there's a tendency to move to what we call a cusp overlap view. Remember, there's three aortic cusps, so you can actually have three cusp overlap view. But the one we are talking about is where the right and the left coronary cusp are overlapping. And that's often in an ario caudal projection. So nowadays there's a trend to move away from this LAO cranial C arm projection towards an ario caudal projection. You can ask yourself, why should that change the risk of conduction abnormality? You can go back to this, uh, was, this uh, slide was presented years back of Nico Piazza, and it shows this double S curve. You all know the yellow S curve here. This is what you get out from your tremensial uh, analysis. This is all the C arm projection where you're going to have the three aortic cusp aligned with the imaging plane. But you can also have a second S curve, the blue one here, where all this is all the C arm projection where the delivery system is aligned with the imaging plane, where you have no parallax in the delivery system. Most of us cannot do this in daily practice. You need to have a dedicated software to, to calculate that uh, double S curve. So we have both for the delivery system and the aortic analyst. But if you have that, you're going to see that these two S curve is almost always crossing in an RIO chordal projection. And the, one of the benefit of working in this projection instead of a LAO cranial is that again, you're going to have both the three aortic cusp aligned with the imaging plane, and you're going to have no parallax 
on your delivery system and thereby a more accurate understanding of how deep are you with your implant in the left ventricular alpha tract and how high should you actually aim to be. And another advantage of working in this REO cordial projection is that you're going to have a kind of a tree chamber view. So you're going to have an elongation of the left ventricular alpha tract compared to a foreshortening of the left ventricular alpha tract in an LAO cranial projection. So again, moving from a classical tree cusp co planar view down to an cusp overlap view, right and left cusp is overlap, you're going to be very close to where you are with your double S curve crossing, and thereby you're going to have the tree autocusp aligned, no parallax in the delivery system, and elongation of the lift and trigger alpha tract. And thereby you have the best option to have a safe, high implantation and thereby reduce the risk of new onset conductance abnormality. So this is just here summarized using this double cusp, uh, uh, double S curve crossing means that both the auto cusp and the delivery system are aligned with the imaging plane. And this is often very close, uh, often in an REO cordial projection with your CR, where also the left and trigger alpha tract is elongated. And Again, the left-right cusp all of you gives you a very similar C arm projection as compared to the double S curve crossing. So I think this is one very important thing as we move forward, particularly to patients who are, have longer life expectancy where we want to avoid new onset conductance abnormality, which is, could, can potentially impact the outcome for the patient to use this cusp all lab technique to reduce the risk of conductance abnormality. That's also, of course, what strategy should you use to try to minimize uh, the risk for the patient to have a permanent pacemaker after the procedure. And you will find there's a lot of algorithms how to define it. The one we use in our institution and it's very safe, when the patient has his TARP implantation implanted, is still in the cat lab in the hybrid room or in the hybrid room, take a 12, 12 lead ECG. If the patient is in sinus rhythm, and the QS duration is less than 150 milliseconds, you can safely remove the pace lead. This patient is not going to develop complete AV block without a sufficient escape rhythm. If the patient is in atrial fibrillation, the QS duration should not exceed 140 milliseconds. But if it's shorter than that, or more narrow than that, again, you can safely reduce the pace lead. And again, one of the things which is often keeping the patient in hospital after the procedure is the observation and the decision-making whether the patient will need a new, permanent, uh, a new permanent pacemaker. But using this algorithm, you can remove your pacemaker, or the temporary pace lead in far the majority of the patient, and you can safely discharge them early on. Next issue is what about the coronary access to the after a TARI procedure. And you can actually divide all transcatheter heart valve into three groups, those with a low stent frame, and of course, an intra and a leaflet position, and those with a high stent frame, where you can either have an intra and a leaflet position or a supra and a leaflet position. And we know particularly for those with, uh, on the right-hand side, high stent frame, supra and a leaflet position, it can be difficult to access the coronary arteries after a TARI procedure. And this was also illustrated in this recent study, the reaccess study. Very simple study, 300 patients undergoing a TARI procedure. The physician was asked to cannulate the left and the right coronary arteries before valve implantation, and immediately after valve implantation, doing the same again, cannulation of the right and left coronary arteries. And surprisingly, maybe to someone, in 23 patients, 7.7% of the patient, it was not possible to access at least uh, both coronary arteries. And out of those 23 patients, the 22 patients was actually treated with an Evolut valve. So for that valve, it was almost 20% of the patient where it was impossible to access uh, both coronary arteries after a TARP implantation. And one of the issues, of course, is that not only is the leaflet position in a 
super NLR uh, position, but also that you do not have what we call commissural alignment. So when we implant this valve, the valve is going to be rotated in a random position in the aortic annulus. And if you get here, as you see on the left-hand side, a complete commercial, commercial misalignment, the commissures are going to be placed right in front of the coronary arteries. And of course, that can make it difficult or even impossible to access the coronary arteries. So what we should aim for is to have commercial alignment as shown here on the right-hand side. The same thing as a surgeon will do when he implant a surgical biprostatic aortic valve. Get commercial alignment, have the same rotation. That is going to facilitate both easier access to the coronary arteries, but probably also better flow to the coronary arteries and durability of these valves. There's been different uh, solution on that. Uh, the one most people will talk about is what was suggested by Gilbert Tang. So when you introduce your delivery system into the patient, have a certain orientation of it to try to get near commercial alignment in all patients. So when this Evolute uh, system was launched, it was recommended to keep the flush port at 12 o'clock pointing towards the ceiling of the room. But Gilbert showed that if you actually rotate it 90, uh, 90 degrees, so it's pointing three o'clock to the patient's left-hand side, you're going to minimize the risk of severe uh, commercial misalignment. But you see here what he actually showed. So if you don't do anything, if you just introduce it with a thrust for 12 o'clock, it's 40% of the patient who got severe commercial misalignment. If you rotate it to three o'clock, it's a lower rate, but it's still 20% of the patient, 20%. The same number as Marco Babanti found in his re access study for the Evidot. So we need to do it better. We cannot have one out of five patients where we cannot access the coronary arteries after a target procedure. So what we should do is that we need to have patient-specific commercial alignment. And to do that, you need to understand where the uh, commissures are located on each stem frame. If you look at the uh, Evolut platform here, you see that you have, of course, three commissures, leaflet posts, and one of these leaflet posts is located right under one of these paddles, the C paddle. So when the valve is introduced into the patient with the flush pot pointing three o'clock, coming around the aortic arts into the ascending aorta and across the aortic valve, you go again, as we discussed before, to this cusp overlap view. Left and right cusp needs to be overlapped. Because in this projection, you know that the commercial between the left and the right cusp is going to point straight to the right-hand side of your fluoro screen. So in this projection, the only thing you need to do is to position one of the commissures on the far right of the screen. And again, you have the C paddle here, so you need to see this configuration, and you can see the paddles on fluoroscopy. And also you need to have this hat marker configuration like this. It needs, needs to look like a hat. If not, you need to do some twisting, rotation on the handle in order to have it. You can do your map yourself, but actually the rotation you need to do to change from a severe commercial misalignment to have a perfect commercial alignment is 3.1 millimeter. Very, very little rotation. So this is shown one again here, just in another view. You have your C arm here in a cusp overlap view. The commissure is pointing to the right-hand side of the floor screen. Position your C paddle here on the right-hand side and have the hat mark configuration. That's going to give you patient-specific commercial alignment. And this is how it's going to look in real life. Again, you have the two paddles here. The C paddle is on the inner curve because you introduce the system with the floss port at three o'clock and you have the hat marker configuration here, and then you start to deploy your valve. And after release, it's confirmed. We are still now, still in a left-right cross ball at you. We have one of the paddles, the C paddle here on the right-hand side, and the non-C paddle on the left-hand side of the screen. So that's going to give you patient-specific commercial alignment. You can also do it for the Acura 2. Here, it's very easy to see where the uh, paddle is because one of the 
the post, the, the what we call the free stint strut here, looks like this configuration. So that just needs to rotate until you have that on the right-hand side of the screen. For the portico or the navigator valve, it's more difficult currently to see those posts. You can see it here in the middle of the stem frame, you need to have one isolator on the right-hand side and two overlapping each other on the left-hand side of the screen. So we did a study here, 60 patients, 20 patients treated with the Evolute platform, 20 with the Accurate, and 20 with the Portico. And you can see the valve which have the highest rate of success was the Accurate valve. Most patients have a commercial alignment or only mild, less for the Evolute platform, and even lesser here for the Portico. Some of the patients actually have severe commercial misalignment. So what is making the difference whether you have commercial alignment and not? There's two factors. First of all, it needs to be easy uh, to, um, to see the stem, uh, stem post. You see, it's very easy with the Evolute, the C paddle and the head configuration. It's very easy with the Accurate, with the free stem strut. It's more difficult with the portico. And second thing is that it needs to be easy to rotate the system when it's across the valve. The Evolut valve is currently in a quite stiff system. It's more difficult to rotate it than it is with the accurate valve and the portico valve. So that's the two factors which is needed to have patient-specific commercial alignment. It needs to be easy to see the leaflet post or the stent post, and it needs to be easy to make those adjustments in the rotation. Third issue is what about patients with bicuspid aortic valves? Remember, as if you're going to expand to patients at a younger age, particularly when you come down below 70 years of age, you're going to see more and more patients coming forward with severe aortic stenosis based on bicuspid aortic valve anatomy. And these valves are often very different from tricuspid aortic valve. It's a heterogeneous size of the cusp and sinus morphology. Often they have very heavily an asymmetric calcification. They have this long intercommissural distance. Also often have a very calcified rafe. Also the aorta is different. Quite a few of these patients have what we call horizontal aorta. You have this angulation between the ST junction and the ascending aorta, and also dilatation of the ascending aorta with the risk of vascular complication during a type of procedure. And again, remember, all these trials, which is a compared transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement, have excluded patients with bicuspid aortic valve. So we do not have any controlled data from randomized trials between surgery and, and TAVA in patients with bicuspid aortic valves. And also, another issue with these uh, valves here in, is that if you have this rafe, a uh, calcified rafe, this thin frame is most likely not going to expand to a circular configuration, particularly if it's a self-expanding technology. And if you're going to have a severe uh, elliptical configuration of the stent frame at the annulus level, how is that going to impact the durability of these leaflets if they're not working in a circular configuration, particularly if you have an interannular leaflet position? And continue here to, to the durability, which again, according to the guideline, is one of the things you need to take into consideration when you decide whether the patient should go for surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. One of the main factors for having a good durability of these biprosthetic aortic valve is that you do not have patient prestige mismatch. And remember, patient prestige mismatch is defined like this. So if you have an opening area of your newly implanted valve of 0.65 square centimeter per square meter or less, you have severe patient position mismatch between 0.65 and 0.85 is moderate and more than 0.85, you have none or only mild uh, patient position mismatch. And there was in the beginning a discussion whether this actually affected the outcome for the patient. But first of all, you can see one of the main factors for valve degeneration is the patient have patient prestige mismatch. So if you put a too small valve into a patient, that valve is likely to going to fail early on. And also the outcome for the patient is going to be affected, the clinical outcome. So this is 
patient prestige mismatch and cardiac related mortality. So you see patients who have moderate PPM got a 30% increased risk of cardiac mortality. And if you have severe PPM, it's more than six times increased mortality rate. So how do we avoid to get uh, patient position mismatch and thereby impair durability? Again, remember the two main valves used for TAVI today is uh, the Sapien Tree platform, balloon expandable technology with an inside lethal position, and the Evolute platform, self-expanding technology with a super analytical position. And if you look here from, from the data from the literature, what is the risk of having patient position mismatch in small aortic annulae defined here of, as an aortic annulus of 23 millimeter or less? You see for the Evolute platform, the risk for severe is pretty low, it's around 5% compared to around 30% here for the Sapien platform. So again, using self-expanding technology is going to give you a much smaller risk of severe patient position mismatch and thereby earlier failure of the valve compared to balloon expandable valves. Also interesting from this figure is that we used to say that this uh, high hemodynamic performance and low risk of patient position mismatch was only for self-expanding technology with a super and a leaflet position. But look here for the portico valve, which is still a self-expanding technology, but with an inter and a leaflet position. The rate of severe patient position mismatch is the same as for the Evlo platform. So it looks like, at least from this study, that no matter whether you're going to use an uh, intra annular or super analytical position, as long as it is a self expanding technology, you're going to have optimal hemodynamic outcome and the lowest risk of patient prestige mismatch, which again is going to drive early valve failure. So if you look here about what is the data we got on durability and the longest data we got uh, for the Sapien platform, platform, again, balloon expanded technology is from the partner two trial. And looking here at the rate of vibrostatic valve failure, which is defined as severe structural valve deterioration, valve re-intervention or valve related death, you see that at five years, the rate for patient undergoing surgery is 1.3% compared to 4.7% for patient undergoing tower. So a three to four times higher rate of failure for patient undergoing tower compared to patient undergoing surgery if you use a balloon expandable technology. On the other hand, if you, if you use a self-expanding technology as here for the first generation core valve, this is the notion trial now with data out to eight years, you see it's at the opposite pattern. Surgical patients, 10% at eight years compared to only 7% for a patient undergoing TAVA. It's numerically different. It's not statistically different, but it could be due to the relative small sample size. So again, remember that if you have a patient with a small aortic anomaly, but with a long a life expectancy, and you're concerned about the durability, implant a valve, which is going to provide optimal hemodynamic outcome, and thereby a lower rate of patient position mismatch and early failure. And we used to say that durability was not a big issue for the patient we, we treated. So in the beginning, as also you saw from the trial, the patient undergoing TAVI had a mean age around 80 years. And just assume that that patient is going to live to he or she is 85 years of age. So this patient have a life expectancy of five years. And even though we do not know the durability of these transcatheter heart valves, but just let us assume it's 10 years, you see today durability is not an issue because the valve is going to survive the patient. But if you in the future is going to treat patients with a much longer life expectancy, and you know, most surgeons are not using any mechanical valves anymore. So even if the patient is 60 years of age or 55 years of age, this patient will be treated with a bioprosthetic valve Let's say that this patient is going for TAVA in the future instead of surgical auto valve replacement. 60 years of age, the patient is still going to live to he or she is 85 years of age. So this patient have 25 years of life expectancy. And if the valve is still going to last 10 years, 
you see that you need to, after when the patient is 70 years of age, to do a valve and valve procedure, 80 years of age, a new re-intervention, and so on. And we know it's possible to put a transcatheter heart valve into a failed transcatheter heart valve. So we can do TAVI and TAVI, and maybe also TAVI and TAVI and TAVI in the future. But what you have to understand is, if you do a TAVI and TAVI, what's going to happen is that the leaflet from the first valve is going to be pushed aside and jammed between the two stent frames. So it's going to create a tunnel of tissue, which may not be a major issue if you have an intraannular leaflet position. You may still be able to access the coronary arteries. But if you have a patient with a super, treated with a supraannular leaflet position, that tunnel of tissue is going to extend from the left ventricular alpha tract through the sinus of a salva into the ascending aorta. So even though you're still going to have flow into the coronary arteries, it's going to be difficult or probably even impossible to access the coronary arteries later on. So just assume this patient was six years of age when he got his first TAVI. When he was 70 years of age, he has his TAVI and TAVI look like this, and he's going to live to his 85. So this patient got 15 years of life expectancy without the possibility to, to access the coronary arteries. What are you going to do the day this patient is admitted with acute coronary syndrome? Of course, this is not acceptable. You could do, before you do your TAVI and TAVI procedure, as we do for some of these surgical valves, we can do a basilica technique, which means we're going to do a laceration of the degenerated leaflet in front of the coronary arteries and then implant the second TAVI valve inside it. But in order to do this, we need to have patient-specific commercial alignment. So if you don't have that upfront, basilica technique is not going to help the issue about access to the coronary arteries after a TAVI and TAVI procedure. So just here to conclude, when we consider to expand the indication for TAVI, be critical and not opportunistic about the evidence from these trials, Short-term outcome may not be sufficient to support time in patients with longer life expectancy. And heart teams are even more important nowadays to make the best counseling for each individual patient. And this is just as I see the heart team should be today. Every patient with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who needs or is considered for rebuilding should have a complete anatomical evaluation by the CT scan looking at the takeoff of the coronary arteries, looking at calcification of the aortic valve, looking at the size of the annulus, what is the length of the membrane septum, as well as a clinical and a paraclinical examination. And based on that, the heart team need to have a discussion. What is the best life term management of this patient? And of course, we're now talking about shared decision making. So after this, has been decided by the heart team, there should be a discussion or a counseling of the patient and the family and make, then make the decision, what is the best treatment for each individual patient looking at lifetime management? Is it surgical aortic valve replacement, TAVA, or maybe medical treatment? Thank you. Thank you, Lars. That was, that was really fantastic. And it highlights a lot of the issues I think we're all struggling with right now when treating patients with a, a longer life expectancy. You know, since the, the new guidelines were published in the US, um, the number of younger patients who are presenting to us here in the US for asking for TAVA uh, significantly increased. And it's, you know, some people think ah, it's now our jobs are easier because, you know, treating younger patients they mobilize you know, sooner, they have less calcification in their, in their arteries, so it's an easier procedure. Actually, the decisions have become much more difficult mm -hmm. uh, than treating the 80-year-old or 85-year-old. And I think you've highlighted some of them. Um, I've asked some, our fellows to join as well because you know, we wanted this to be interactive and really allow them to uh, ask their questions. So I'm gonna let them start and then I have a couple of questions on my own. So Jesse, you want to start? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Sondergaard. Thank you so much for, uh, for a really wonderful talk. Um, I'm not doing uh, structural yet, maybe, but uh, still made it digestible for me, and I, I really gained a lot from it. 
Um, I think my, my big question is a, a lot of studies uh, for TAVR really, at least initially, we act upon evidence looking at 30 day, uh, one year and three year outcomes. But when we're talking about younger patients, um, really the question, as you pointed out, becomes durability and long-term outcomes. So in terms of uh, studies, when they're designed comparing SAVR versus TAVR for younger patients or patients with uh, bicuspid aortic valve, what level of evidence and, and what type of evidence are you going to be looking for before you start to perform these procedures routinely in younger patients and patients with bicuspid valve? Are we really going to be waiting 10 or 15 years to see long-term outcomes or do you know, is this the type of thing where we really can start changing our practice based off of 30 day and, and one year outcomes? And that's a good question. And, and remember, these are very well conducted studies we have seen uh, even the two last uh, low risk trials, but it's, it's studies which has been designed and conducted by industry. So that's why it's very strict about an indication for going into the, or for the inclusion exclusion criteria to get into the trial. So again, Remember what kind of patient was actually treated. And if you have a patient which didn't fulfill this criteria, maybe that's not the patient you should expand it to. And also, also remember, as it is for surgical aortic valve replacement, it's the same for TAVI. The patient is going to be bound to the first valve you implant. That's going to follow the patient for life on with conduction abnormality, access to the coronary arteries, durability, possibility for revalving, and so on. So I think it's extremely important to just not look at 30 days mortality because we know that we can treat really, really sick patient at a very low risk, but that's not uh, the issue. The issue is what's going to happen down the line that this valve is going to fail and how's this conduction abnormality going to impact the outcome for the patient and so on. So I, I don't think we're going to see um, any of, uh, at least not many new randomized trials. I think that's, that's gone. We're going... But we're going to have a discussion about how to optimize the procedure and also have an open discussion with the surgeons, not only be blinded as an operator or as a patient going for the easy fix, you know, and the procedure taking less than an hour and patient at home next day, but really think what is the best lifetime management for this patient. And I think it's a very, very complex uh, decision. And we cannot just pinpoint one factor which needs to be fulfilled. It's going to be different from patient to patient how it's important is for this patient to access the coronary arteries in the future. I mean, if the patient is old and have no uh, coronary artery disease, it's probably not an issue. But if the patient already have a stent in the LAD or have a longer life expectancy, it's going to be crucial to access it. And what are we going to do with the day the valve is going to fail? How can we revalve this? Uh, and, and so I think as uh, we discussed before, the heart team need to be even... Uh, more enforced than it used to be to have all these factors included in the discussion and then counseling the patient. For bicuspid aortic valve, I mean, it's also a great example. You know, everyone, we see all this registry coming out on how well TAVI is done in bicuspid aortic valve. Why haven't we seen any randomized trials? You can ask yourself, because the registry is only showing the patient who was accepted for for time, a patient who is highly selective because we think time is going to do well in this patient, but we cannot conclude that's from that, that we have the evidence to actually expand to everyone, even at a younger age with bicuspid aortic valves. We need to see more robust evidence on, on these patients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lars, there's a question from one of the, um, the participants. Is, is there a tool or risk score that you use to estimate life expectancy? Because I guess it's different for every country. And then there are, there are other variables that impact life expectancy. It's not just the number. I, I don't think there's any tools. I mean, uh, what we, we, uh, we have every single patient is, is assessed by a dedicated nurse. But these are mostly elderly patients looking at frailty and so on. But we also have patients walking into the office, you know, a patient who is 60 or even 55 years of age, no comorbidity in a very good shape, and just say, I, have, I know all the literature. I still want a time procedure. And I think that's, that's uh, the most challenging uh, today because we know that if the patient insists, he or she is going to get uh, the time procedure, but it may be a wrong decision <laughs> up front. Uh, and maybe the patient will be better served with having a surgical or aortic valve replacement for his 
bicuspid, severely calcified valve, good size valve put in. And then it can come back 10, 15 years down the line and we could do a target machine in that. But it's, it's difficult nowadays uh, uh, to, con to convince these patients. And, and I don't think we have any, as just ask for a tool, but, but just eyeballing, you can see this patient have no comorbidity today and he's a younger age. So, so he's likely to, to survive for another 20 or 30 years. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges we've had is we've had patients come to us who are sort of in the 65 year range, okay? And they've heard about Tava, they've spoken to maybe their local cardiologist and they come to us and they want Tava. And when you go through uh, the counseling process, I guess you are good care for Tava, but you have to realize that at 65 or 64, if you get a Tava, it does not mean you will not get a stenotomy, at least one stenotomy in your life. That's the thing that surprises them the most mm -hmm. because they think that you know if you start with Tava at 64, 65, you'll never get a stenotomy because that's what they're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard to promise a patient, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I think you can only do Tava in Tava so many times. And it's also based on the initial anatomy. And if you do things like commissural alignment on your first valve, right, whether you can revalve it. And, and also, I mean, the, I didn't discuss it. There's also the discussion about the sequence. Should the patient start with a surgical or valve replacement then have a Tava and then a Tava and Tavia? Should start yeah. with Tavi first on and then have a surgical expansion later on and a, uh, and a surgical valve and then a Tavi later on. But I think, I mean, um, patient who's won a Tavi procedure as a 60 years of age, he or she is not when uh, the age is now 70 or 75 going to sign up for a surgical procedure with an expectation of the valve, which may in some of these patients in, involve a root uh, replacement. Right. It's going to be much more complex uh, procedures. So again, it's back to what we start to discuss. Uh, consider lifetime management from day one, because the procedure you're going to do today is going to follow the patient lifelong. Yeah. Oh. Manaf, Manaf is our structural fellow. I uh, think see if he has any questions, Manaf. Dr. Um Great uh, overview. Of, Could you speak uh, up and out a little bit soft? Sure. Great, great overview of lifetime management um, of these patients. Um, my question is sort of, sort of similar along the lines of what you guys have been discussing, but I, I'm just curious. Now that I'm um, recently started formally my structural fellowship, I've been attending the clinics uh, more regularly, and I'm just wondering what your approach is again, in that, in those patients that are in that 60 to 65 range, when you're talking to them, how do you make this really kind of complex risk benefit um, discussion digestible for a patient in order to give them kind of the best information so that they can make um, the right decision apart, whether, you know, aside from just, I, I don't want my, my chest cut open, how do you introduce that nuance of, of the risk benefit um, in the in the patient discussion in the clinic. Yeah, first of all, um, we start out with a uh, assessment of the patient with the phrases going on by the nurses, and then we have the CT scan, and then we have the heart team discussion, and and try to decide what do we think uh, from our current knowledge would be the best treatment for the patient, and then we go back and discuss it with the patient. I mean, most patients is actually quite um, sensible. So if you if you sit down and explain we we think this is going to be the best option for you and that's going to be surgery, most patients will accept it. There will still be patients who, who are very insistent and will say, no, I, I don't want a surgical algebraic replacement. I want a TAVI. But that may be, I don't know, a page, one patient a month or something like that. It's, it's not a huge number. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Ralph. I was, I was gonna ask some questions in the chat, but if you have a follow-up, yeah, I did have a, a, a follow-up. So Lars, you know, when you look at your data and the data you presented and the data when I look at the data, it's certainly looking like super annular valves um, have really great durability. Well, at least that's the data we have. You, you know, there's your data from Notion showing eight-year durability, uh, looking better than surgical valves. The best data we have with balloon expandable valves, like you said, is only five years and it's not, doesn't look that much better than surgery. Um, so one of the things, you know, I struggle with a little bit is, 
you know, if we take a patient with longer life expectancy and we think about lifetime management, if I want to give that patient, based on the current data we have, which is limited, a valve that's going to last the longest, it's going to be a supraannular valve. However, that's also the valve from the data that's going to be the most challenging to access the coronaries or to do tava and tava, right? Um, just, you know, any thoughts on you know, what we should be choosing as our first valve, number one. And number two, you know, the other challenge I have as well is that I don't know if we have the right tools right now when assessing a young patient as to try and figure out, you know, what is it going to look for that patient when they have their tava and tava? Mm. Okay, so it almost feels like we're missing some tools, like a simulation tool that mm. you can put in the first valve and then a second valve into that patient's CAT scan to try and have some sort of assessment of what mm. it's going to look like 15 years from now. Mm. Yeah, with your first questions, um, which valves should we choose for a patient? I think you have to look at um, all the anatomical factors. Let's say the patient is coming to you and the CT scan show that the, the annular size is 27 millimeter. I don't think it's matter. You can give this patient a balloon expandable valve, it's still going to large. It's going to be an issue when you come down to the small aortic annular. That Then you have to think twice uh, what kind of valve you're going to choose. We know that if the surgeons are treating this patient, there's a high likelihood that the patient is going to have a too small valve, uh, particularly because the patient, well, the surgeons are rarely doing this root enlargement during the procedure. So for these patients, it would be probably be a better option to, with smaller, smaller aortic annulae, to go for TAVA and go to give them a self-expanding technology. Okay. Uh, your second question is, what about, um, uh, was it revalving uh, these patients? Uh, and how should we take that into consideration? Again, if you look at the American guidelines, first of all, if you, um, you see one of the, the, the two important factors to make the decision is, patient's life expectancy and the durability of the biostatic valve. And, but I think today where we have, as you said, five years follow up on balloon expandable valve, you have eight years from the notion trial, which was a very premature trial, early trial. I mean, we do not know what the durability is. So how, how should we take that into the discussion? It's, it's not a qualified discussion uh, in our days. It's going to be a gut feeling what we, we think, what kind of valve can we put into the patient and what is, is the durability. We know we yeah. can do TAVA and TAVA. There has been studies published, uh, meta, uh, multi-sites, uh, multi-center studies on, on this. It is possible, but we also know that one of the issues is future access to the coronary arteries. So again, um, if you want to, to plan for TAVA today and, and already today, think 10 years ahead, when I'm going to do a TAVA and TAVA, you should probably try to make a simulation. How's your first valve going to sit? And let's say you're later on going to do a, a TAV in TAV. How's that going to, to make it possible to access the coronary arteries? Are the coronary arteries having a high takeoff? It's going to be a wide sinus of a salva, so it's not going to be an issue, or will it be an issue? So I think that there's a lot of things we, we, we can do better than we do today. Uh, I mean, everyone has been focused for years about just to have a safe procedure, you know, no gradient, no PVL, no pacemaker patient early home. But I think it's going to be, we discussed that several times uh, the last hour, a, a much more complex discussion. Absolutely. And durability is one of the issues. But let's say, as I said before, if the patient have a large aortic annulus where we think we can have avoid patient procedure mismatch, but have coronary artery disease, maybe the, it's the coronary access we should consider uh, as a first choice. Or if the patient already had pre-existing conduction abnormality, we are concerned about a pacemaker. That should be what we, we should uh, discuss. I don't think you cannot make, you cannot say this, this valve is going to be the best. I mean, you have to look at each individual patient and, and make a priority list. What is the most important thing to this patient and then try to, to choose your valve. Yeah, absolutely. Manaf, uh, do you want to address the last few questions with Dr. Sondergaard from the chat? Sure. Um... Dr. Ture uh, asks, um, in, in younger low-risk patients, um, again, sort of talking about thinking down the line, um, is it better to have the sternotomy up front and then, um, and then give yourself the opportunity to do um, TAV and SAV down the line? Or can we think about 
possibly going up front with the TAVR and then getting the surgery later down the line, possibly when they're higher risk? How do you approach that? Um, uh, in, so, in so let's say that when you say a younger patient, this is a patient who are somewhere between 60 and 65 years of age. Remember, if that patient is coming forward with a severe aortic stenosis, it's most likely due to a bicuspid aortic valve. And I think if you have a bicuspid aortic valve with severe calcification, I think personally today, with the evidence we have today, this patient should go for a surgical aortic valve replacement. Have the surgeons to take all the calcium out, uh, decalcify the annulus, put a good size valve in, which is, is prone to have a, a, a valve in valve procedure laid on. I, I think it's uh, outside studies. I don't think you should treat these patients with TAVI. Um, if, if, if you want to do it, it should be part of a study where you gain uh, evidence for how to move forward. Great, agreed. Um, one of our co-fellows asks about patients with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Is there any data on the long term on the long term durability of uh, TAVI in those patients? I haven't seen any data on uh, on the durability uh, whether that should be affected on it. Uh, so. So it's a, it's a very good question. I haven't thought about that. Um, and, you know, just thinking back about uh, the, the two studies, uh, one, one thing that came to my mind uh, regarding um, uh, self-expanding and balloon expandable valves at five and, and eight years, um, you know, I know when you're comparing the two uh, studies, it looks like the self-expanding has uh, has better or similar outcomes to surgery, but I couldn't help but notice that the uh, surgical failure rate was like 1% in the balloon expandable and 10% in the self-expandable. Um, so relatively, uh, you know, the, the self-expanding TAVR valve looks a lot better, but is there any, has there been any discussion about that discrepancy in the, the surgical outcomes? Yeah. And, it's a and good question. First of all, remember one is at five years and the other one is at eight years, but there's certainly a difference. I mean, until recently, we, there was a discussion, how do you find, define durability? If we look what the surgeons were doing in, in the old days, a, a valve failure was a patient who underwent a re-intervention. So let's say that a patient had a failing valve, but the surgeon did not want to offer a re-intervention. That patient was not counted. Now we have consensus report 2017. We had uh, the European consensus report, how to define it, dividing up to valve dysfunction and valve failure. And I think it was this year, the WAC3 consensus report was also published, also defining durability. It's, they're, they're similar, but not exactly the same. The Notion trial was reporting according to the European consensus report, the partner two according to the WAC3 consensus report. I think that explained some of the discrepancy between those two uh, studies. Graham. Thanks, Manaf uh, and Jesse, Samina, for all your questions. Uh, Lars, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I already feel bad that you took an hour out of your vacation. Uh, so we're going to let you get back to enjoying your vacation. I really appreciate it uh, taking the time. We learned so much from you. And I look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully in London or uh, for TCT. Okay. okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.